and welcome to this special session of the Pauline Mayer Early American History Seminar. My name is Kanesorn Wall Street Channelai. I'm the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm joined by Katie Morris, the Assistant Director of Research, who is monitoring affairs in the background, and we are testing out our brand new hybrid room for the first time. We would like to thank Chris Coveney, the Historical Society's Chief Technology and Media Officer, who is managing the cameras in the room. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank members of the steering committee for this seminar. They are Professors Kate Grangine of Wellesley College, Lisa Wilson of Connecticut College, Paul Musselwhite of Dartmouth College, and Brendan McConville of Boston University. The schedule for today's program is as follows. I shall introduce our guest of honor this evening, along with the presenters as their turn to speak approaches. Each presenter has 10 minutes to speak. We shall conclude with some remarks from Professor Dan Richter. And if we have time, we can take comments and, uh, from the audience as well. Now, on to the program and the man of the hour. Daniel K. Richter is the former Richard S. Dunn Director of the McNeil Center for Early American Studies and the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania. His numerous works include the Ordeal of the Longhouse, the Peoples of the Iroquois League in the Era of European Colonization, which received both the Frederick Jackson Turner Award and the Ray Allen Billington Prize from the Organization of American Historians. Facing East from Indian Country, a Native History of Early America, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History and won the Lewis Gottschalk Prize in 18th Century History. Before the Revolution, America's Ancient Past, which was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 10 best nonfiction books of 2011. In 2017 and 2018, he received a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship and was named the Robert C. Ritchie Distinguished Fellow in Early American History at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. In 2016, Professor Richter received the Provost Award for Distinguished PhD Teaching and Mentoring from the University of Pennsylvania. And that is the reason we are gathered here today. A truly distinguished scholar is not only someone who opens our eyes to the marvels of the past, who teaches us about its complexities, who reminds us the, that we, are, we still have much to learn about our society and whose rigorous pursuits of tr the truth paves the way for others to follow. No, a truly distinguished scholar is also someone who is the mentor and teaches generation after generation about how to learn, to think, to explore the past, to research, to analyze, and to teach. And now to the recording from the 3rd of May, 2022. We start with Sari Altshuler, Associate Professor of English and Founding Director of the Health, Humanities and Society Minor and Initiative at Northeastern University. She is the author of The Medical Imagination, Literature and Health in the Early United States. Her work has appeared in leading journals, including Early American Literature, the Journal of the Early Republic and the medical journal, The Lancet. She is currently working on a book about disability and citizenship in the early United States. Professor Altshuler. Um, thank you so much uh, to Kid and to everyone at the MHS um, for, it, for convening this uh, really special event um, and for um, inviting all of us to take part. I feel really deeply honored to be here. Um, so as Kid mentioned, I'm Sarah Altshuler. Uh, I'm a scholar of 18th and 19th century American literature, health humanities, and disability studies. And I'm currently writing a book about disability and citizenship that is particularly attuned to the ways that the historical experiences of particular disabilities um, can help us understand the cultural formations of citizenship differently. But these sentences don't do much to describe my indebtedness to Dan. And if I'm honest, um, the idea of giving these remarks made me pretty nervous. In some ways, I think it's really easy uh, to um, fet Dan. He's been such a force in early American studies, a kind of prime mover and organizer that praising his life's work seems natural. But I've struggled a lot with getting it right, how to express how grateful I am for everything that he's taught me and how much I owe him. Sending myself emails in the middle of the night about things that I might say that then felt insufficient in the morning. 
this kind of nervousness brings me back to some of the early nervousness I had in some of our first encounters. Um, I wanted so much to impress this towering figure whose rigor, intelligence, and humility were so palpable. In my first trips to the center, I would get up the courage to finally join a conversation that Dan was part of, um, and then everything would go pretty horrifically wrong. <laughs> In one particularly memorable conversation, I remember talking myself into a corner until I found myself describing some of my graduate school peers less than legal recreational habits. Um, <laughs> And I just kept thinking abort, but I couldn't, um, <laughs> I couldn't get out of it. Uh, so I feel really glad to have been forgiven such early missteps and deeply honored to have been welcomed into Dan's capacious community anyway. In fact, it's Dan's grace, his generosity, and his community building that I'd like to spend my time on today. That's to say that although we can all agree that Dan's scholarship offers an incredible model of how to write and how to research, Arguably, I think his most significant legacy in the field of early American studies is the kind of scholarly community that he's made possible. I know I was far from the only graduate student to approach the doors of the McNeil Center with my heart in my throat, only to be warmly welcomed. At Dan Richter's center, you checked rank, affiliation, and accolades at the door and greeted each other, first and foremost, as minds engaged in a communal endeavor. This is not to say that critique was quashed, far from it. Rather, Dan cultivated a warm, rigorously intellectual community, one where ideas always came first, whether you were a doctoral candidate or a distinguished professor. Engagement was not only encouraged, but expected, and everyone got their turn. This kind of climate feels natural to those of us who came up through the center but I later came to recognize that it was really the result of very thoughtful orchestration on Dan's part. At the first brown bag of my fellowship year, Dan began by declaring that there would be no arrogance. This sentence transformed what could possibly, it could and probably would have been a much more competitive atmosphere into a really collegial one. I could have, uh, sorry, I, I could continue to sing Dan's praises, but actually I thought in the spirit of collegiality and mentorship that um, it would be better to share some words of other community members and friends that I was lucky enough to meet at the center. And I'm excerpting here, but um, I actually have put together a little book uh, with some of them. Uh, so um, so we, we will, uh, I'll give that to you later. Um, Glenda Goodman writes that in Dan's mentorship, quote, generosity takes the shape of holding a mirror up to reflect what scholars are trying to do, which he does especially well because he usually does so as a question, quote, would you say this is what you were saying or doing? Honestly, I feel like that's what an anthropologist would do, asking people if they recognize themselves in what he says. I find this very moving and effective because it gives people a way to grow because they see themselves from his point of view. I also think this mentorship is congruent with his scholarship, which is similarly sympathetic and patient and tries respectfully to get inside a society or situation. He's deeply humble and seems to want to facilitate historical people's stories coming out in ways that they would recognize. In both of these areas, mentorship and scholarship, he's never given me the sense that he's interested in disciplinary gatekeeping and seems genuinely interested about scholars and scholarship, period. Danielle Skihan writes, he actively supports young scholars and has a sustained investment in making early American studies interdisciplinary. He takes literary scholars, art historians, archaeologists, and the like seriously, and is willing to meet them on their own methodological terms. It takes some brilliance to see, to be able to see promising scholarship and projects outside your disciplinary space. In doing so, he's been invested in the longevity of early of the field of early American studies and has had the foresight to see scholarship in the field needs to move beyond disciplinary and methodological silos. Well, she concludes, I love Dan and I wish I could be there. There was also a limerick that, um, <laughs> that for everyone's sake, uh, we decided not to include. <laughs> but you can, you can give her a hard time about it afterwards. Uh, Dale Norwood writes that he thinks of Dan as quote, primarily, as a model of how to create institutions that feed people, literally and figuratively, and more rarely to do so with a means and a position of humility and patience, 
In those moments where I've tried to gather folks together for a common purpose, I've always had Dan in mind as a model of how to use respectful quiet to create space for productive conversation in a discipline and industry where being aggressive, exclusive, close-minded, or mean can sometimes seem like the only mode of leadership on offer. He's been a consistent example of just how effective being kind, patient, open, and honest, and honestly a bit awkward, can be, and I'm grateful for that. I have also enjoyed, long enjoyed groaning at his puns, though I have, I have not yet become learned enough to understand the more obscure Quaker jokes. <laughs> And Cassie Good describes Dan as, quote, a scholar and mentor who is kind, supportive, and humble despite his obvious importance. He could be enthusiastic about papers of any topic, and I don't remember him ever saying a negative word about anyone or their work. He, would, he also had a wry sense of humor showcased by his on-topic ties. She still remembers you wearing a tie with Gumby on it the day that you taught about the Puritans because, Dan said, they and Gumby were opposites when it came to flexibility. <laughs> I finally remember how he sometimes ate lunch with the fellows upstairs and stayed much later than I did when the fellows had a party at the center that went past midnight. And this, Cassie's memories actually reminded me of one of my fondest center memories. Um, my, the year I was there, some fellows had an extremely silly idea that we would have a competition to see who could, who could come up with the best definitions for 18th century words. Um, and there were mob caps and tri-corner hats involved, and it was extremely nerdy fun. Um, but we assumed that Dan would not be interested in joining us to which he was quite indignant that we would assume such a thing. And of course he wiped the floor with us. There are some pictures that won't ever see the light of day, um, but I actually did get Dan a mob cap if he wants to model for you later. <laughs> so uh, Dan did ask us to keep this light. So I'm doing my best here. More seriously, um, I'm in awe of the kindness and generosity and serious attention that Dan gave to so many of us as we grew up as scholars. He's the mentor that we can only hope to find in our careers and one I strive on my best days to be. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't close by mentioning that the lifelong relationships and stewardship made possible are not only intellectual, but personal, and in some cases, even romantic. <laughs> so in one 3 a.m. musing, I realized that by my count, Dan can claim credit for at least six kids. And, um, <laughs> and I thought about um, you know, what I thought was maybe a very Dan fashion that I might have a picture of all of them up there. Um, and each one of them uh, would have their own bodies, but Dan's head instead, um, <laughs> which luckily for him seemed like a terrifically bad idea in the morning. Um, so I'll leave it to you to picture. I wanted to close by saying, thank you, Dan. I remain deeply grateful to have come up under your mentorship, which has made so much possible afterward. Knowing you has made me a better scholar and a better person. We love you, Dan. All right, thank you very much. Our next presenter is joining us from the internet, Alicia DeMeo graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 2013 with a bachelor's degree in history and English. She earned her PhD in history from Harvard University in 2020. She is currently an upper division history teacher at Horace Mann School in the Bronx, New York, where she has taught Atlantic world history, United States history, Latin American history, and is developing a course on the history of gender and sexuality in the United States. Dr. DeMeo. Thank you, thank you so much to the MHS, especially Kid and Katie for organizing this event. Thank you to Chris Parsons for inviting me to participate. I'm so excited to be here, albeit virtually on this panel. So I bring a different perspective on Dan's work as a teacher and a historian. Dan was my professor when I was an undergraduate at Penn. He shepherded me and 10 other history majors through the process of writing our honors theses. For most of us, our first long-term writing project. Looking back on the experience now as a high school teacher and after completing an even longer term research project as part of my PhD, I want to highlight the many valuable lessons Dan taught me about the historian's craft. These lessons now inform my own teaching as I try to make my students stronger thinkers and writers. 
So here's a list of things that I still remember learning 10 years later. Number one, consider the software program in which you write. In 2012, we in the thesis seminar were committed to using the most up-to-date word processing technology, Microsoft Word. This baffled Dan, who had a long-standing hatred of Microsoft Word, <laughs> and at least in 2012, preferred to use WordPerfect. We thought that was rather old fashioned and a bit ridiculous, although of course, every time Word would malfunction, causing us to lose our work, Dan would respond with some version of, I keep telling you that program is evil. <laughs> Turns out Dan got the last laugh. None of my high school students use Word. They all use Google Docs. Last year in my first year of teaching, I showed my ninth graders how to create footnotes in Google Docs. When I introduced how to create footnotes in Word, they looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Word? Dr. DeMeo, they said, in the kind of condescending tone teenagers have mastered when they're addressing someone deeply uncool, no one uses Microsoft Word. I too have been transitioning to Google Docs for my school-related writing, but for old time's sake, I wrote this talk in Microsoft Word. <laughs> Number two, the research process is messy and unpredictable and involves a lot of stumbling around in the dark until you figure out where you are going. The thesis seminar at Penn spanned an entire calendar year. The junior year spring semester involved solidifying a topic and performing initial research. Summer could be used for archival research and writing occurred in the fall. Helpfully, the entire process ended by December of senior year thus avoiding senior spring burnout or apathy. Many of us had never completed much archival research before. A student asked Dan, can you tell us about the summer in between our two seminars? In typical Dan deadpan fashion, he replied, well, it will be hotter than it is now. <laughs> well, of course, this is funny. I think it also speaks to a central tenet of the research process. It's very uncertain and it's different for every person. This is something I've been trying to emphasize to my juniors and seniors who are completing research projects this, this semester. They want concrete answers to things like, how many sources should I have? It frustrates them when I tell them, I don't know, it's going to be different for everyone. But it's also a wonderful lesson for them to be intellectually flexible and adaptable. At the same time, Dan also provided a truly excellent concrete model for research that shaped the way I completed my own research in graduate school and influences how I currently teach research. He described to us the research sandwich, primary sources being the meat and other fixing of the sandwich and secondary sources being the bread. You start making a sandwich with a piece of bread, then you add the fixings, then you top with another piece of bread. So you should proceed with research. First, read some secondary sources so you have context when you analyze primary sources, then return back to the secondary sources to make sense of anything in the primary sources that you still don't understand. While doing my own research in graduate school, I found that it was more of a triple-decker sandwich with layers of bread and fixings, but it works remarkably well as a method for structuring shorter research projects, especially for students who are less familiar with historical research. So I've been revising my research assignments to more explicitly match the research sandwich method. Number three, it's important to stay humble and not think too highly of yourself or your historical skills. Our first major assignment in the spring semester of the thesis program was a primary source analysis. Remember, this is the honors thesis seminar. We were the top history students in the class of 2013. Imagine then my surprise, shock, and dismay when I received my paper back only to find a big C plus at the bottom. I was devastated. A C plus? I got a C plus in calculus. History is what I was supposed to be good at. This is what I was planning on pursuing as a career. What was I going to do with my life now? A whole existential crisis ensued. And Dan allowed us to revise our source analyses, incorporating his extensive feedback. To further reflect on this experience, in preparation for these remarks, I did something utterly horrifying, 
which is that I dug out that initial primary source analysis from the depths of my computer and I read it. Was it C plus bad? No, <laughs> but it was not good either. The source I analyzed was a satirical poem written by John Quincy Adams about the Lewis and Clark expedition. My depth of analysis was seriously lacking. It didn't go much beyond, as a Federalist, Adams opposed this expedition as part of Jefferson's Republican agenda. Reading this now, my teacher brain promptly responded, well, 22-year-old Alicia, so what? Why is this significant? Something I am constantly writing on my students' papers. I unfortunately don't have Dan's comments on the piece, but I do have the revised version of the primary source analysis. The revised version features much more research on the context of the poem, Adams' shifting political views, the publication history of the poem, all of which allowed me to tease out much more specifically Adams' intended audience, which helped me explain why the poem mattered. Later, Dan remarked to all of us that he gave us those poor grades on purpose to push us outside of our comfort zone, to make us work harder, think deeper, research more. He said something to the effect of, I wanted you to jump and that grade was me asking you to jump. And you all responded in your revisions with, you want us to jump? Okay, how high? Teaching at a private high school has led me to interact with many grade conscious students. While I don't deliberately give C pluses to push my students, I don't quite have the guts for that. I do remind them that the grade is not a reflection of who they are as a person, but a marker of their current skill level. Whenever I do raise the bar to challenge a stronger student, I think of that C plus and I hope my feedback and encouragement have the same effect. Number four, language is weird, but also fundamental to the craft of history. As I'm sure many of you know, Dan loves puns. This comes from a place of deep appreciation for the English language. Dan loved to remark to us in the thesis seminar about how he was both a member of the standing faculty and the current sitting Roy and Jeanette P. Nichols endowed chair. That example really highlighted how language could be seemingly meaningless and yet the words we choose matter. We should always be striving for the most specific word to express ourselves in the most deliberate and precise way possible. He struck into us a fear of passive voice and scare quotes both strategies that could mask meaning. Who is doing the action? What are you actually trying to say about the use of that word when you put quotes around it? He ruthlessly cut down our sentences, forcing us to be concise. He had to wade through many drafts of my overwrought prose, once remarking that he thought I was unconsciously imitating the 19th century sources I was reading. <laughs> I kept that in mind as I continued to write about the 19th century in graduate school. Teaching ninth graders how to write is a continual battle against overwrought prose. Teenagers, of course, want to be taken seriously and they often write in a way that they think will sound smart, but is usually incomprehensible. Hmm, maybe not so different from most academics. Teaching students to use less words is hard because using less words means that you need to really think about and understand what it is you are trying to say, which in writing takes time and is part of the process. But in the spirit of Dan's tutelage, we keep practicing. I challenge them to condense two sentences into one, to take out filler transition words and adverbs, to use active voice. We historians are at heart storytellers, but if no one can understand our stories, how can we convey our knowledge about the past? How can we communicate at all? The stakes around language are actually quite high, something I try to emphasize to my students all the time and something I never really thought about until Dan read my writing. There are many other lessons I remember from the thesis seminar. Dan's love of M dashes, which he considered dramatic, his thoughts about footnotes, the graveyard of ideas. If it's not important enough for the text, it's not important. <laughs> Mostly, I remember feeling very lucky that I could spend a few hours each week sitting in the McNeil Center seminar room, much fancier than any other Penn classroom, although also subject to impromptu fire alarm exoduses when a fellow would burn popcorn in the microwave upstairs, learning from someone who truly loves everything about the craft of history and who is, to be imprecise, very, very good at it. 
I continue to hope in my own teaching, I can help pass on some of those lessons to future historians and citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Elizabeth Ellis. She is an assistant professor of history and the director of the Native Studies Forum at New York University. In the fall, she will be joining the history department at Princeton University as an assistant professor. Her forthcoming book is titled The Great Power of Small Nations, Indigenous Diplomacy in the Gulf South. Dr. Ellis also writes about contemporary indigenous issues and political movements and is committed to organizing and fighting for indigenous self-determination. She is a citizen of the Peoria tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. Dr. Ellis. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to Kid, is, this is on, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> to Kid and Katie and to the Massachusetts Historical Society for hosting this event. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and to have the opportunity to recognize the brilliance, generosity, warmth, and pathbreaking scholarship that Dan brought to the field of early American studies. As most of you know, and as Sari's mentioned, one of Dan's defining qualities is his immense humility. So while I'm sure he's anxious for the part where we all embarrass him by telling him how much we appreciate his mentorship and publications to be over, I'm at least glad that we have a small break in the COVID isolation to gather and celebrate Dan's influence on the field. From 2015 to 2017, I was the postdoctoral fellow at the McNeil Center. And in that time, I had the opportunity to get to learn from Dan and from two wonderful cohorts of fellows at the center. Of course, being at the center also provided me with the chance to learn more than perhaps anyone ever wanted to know about Benjamin Rush, the political leanings of Yingling, and whether or not one could really trust Hinky's process to revive the 76ers. <laughs> I had just finished graduating uh, grad school at the University of North Carolina, and I wasn't really sure if I was planning to stay in academia. Early America and the discipline of history as a whole has a reputation for being very difficult and an inhospitable place for Native folks. So while I was passionate about my research, I was not certain that this would be the best way for me to serve my community, or the most welcoming profession. Dan and the community he fostered at the McNeil Center is a big part of the reason why I've stayed. I know that my, from many of the other scholars we'll hear about, we'll speak more broadly about Dan's influence on early America, so I'm gonna focus specifically on Native America. For much of the 20th century, American Indian history was dominated by scholarship that framed stories of Native American and European encounters almost exclusively as either these celebratory stories of conquests of tribal peoples and lands, or of accounts of the tragic but inevitable demise of tribal peoples um, and lifeways in response to European arrival. Academic historians bemoaned the lack of written sources that prevented them from including Native perspectives and experiences in stories of early America. And instead, much of the scholarship on Indigenous peoples was conducted by anthropologists who were concerned with the loss of tribal cultures and the supposed disintegration of our Indianness through our adoption of corrupting items like jean shorts and bologna sandwiches. But American Indian activism gradually forced academic scholars to take Native history seriously. In the 1940s, tribal governments hired anthropologists and historians to help them put together documentation and narratives that would support their lawsuits against the federal government for land theft and financial mismanagement. The work of these scholars for cases that came before the Indian Claims Commission, which adjudicated grievances brought by tribal nations against the federal government between the 1940s and 1970s, helped give birth to the field of ethnohistory. A few decades later, in the 1960s and 70s, a new generation of American Indian youth launched the Red Power Movement. And although the American Indian movement's primary demands were related to the upholding of treaties and sovereignty, I think we should remember that during their occupation of Alcatraz, Red Power activists called for the creation of American Indian studies departments and courses. And then indigenous women like Cheyenne River Sioux activist, Madonna Thunderhawk, created survival schools. This is what they called that whole category of um, schools for native children, where they taught native children to be proud to be Indian and focused on developing historical curriculum that prevented, presented indigenous people as fully human and as actors of change, instead of helpless victims or bloodthirsty savages. So from across Indian country by the 1970s, there was an immense demand to tell American Indian stories. 
In this post-American Indian movement era, the next generation of scholars stepped up to tackle Indigenous history. By the late 1970s, historians like Fida Perdue and Francis Jennings were finding new ways to use archival records to tell Haudenosaunee and Cherokee histories and providing far more critical analyses of European empires and US settlers dealings with native people. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, ethno historians, including Richard White, James Merrill, Dan Usner, and Dan Richter, were paving the way for a new generation of native history. Dan's pathbreaking 1992 ordeal of the Longhouse reframed the way that historians understood the political and social systems that sustained the Haudenosaunee community through multiple crises of colonization and provided fresh interpretations of the Beaver Wars and the influence that the Haudenosaunee held over their European and indigenous neighbors. This 1990s era scholarship and the generation of scholars trained by this wave of historians of Native America produced what scholars called the new Indian history. Now in the era of the rise of Native American and indigenous studies in early America, where historians can comfortably use not just ethno-historical methodologies, but also indigenous theory and approaches, um, we're, the field is thriving and the work of scholars like Jeannie O'Brien, Julie Reed, Ned Blackhawk, Michael Wicken, and so many others has completely changed a lot of our understandings of Native America, of the past, and of the indigenous present. I first read Dan's work in graduate school when our methods class was assigned, assigned Facing East from Indian Country. In this beautifully written and engaging text, Dan asks readers to consider Native history from indigenous eyes and perspectives. In my dissertation, I even mirrored Dan's strategy of opening each section with an imaginative vignette designed to get at the texture of Native life where sources might be slim. Three decades on, Dan's work continues to critically shape the field. When I teach early American history, I love assigning his Legacies of Power for Medieval North America chapter. It's the first chapter in Before the Revolution, because as the title suggests, Dan uses this chapter to provide a sweeping overview of the complex, large-scale Indigenous societies across the continent from Chaco Canyon to Cahokia. His insistence on Indigenous social and political sophistication helps dismantle students' enduring assumptions that America was some kind of vast wilderness where we were all far too busy singing to raccoons to focus on building monumental architecture or engineering sustainable agriculture. When I was at the McNeil Center, I was working on this project that became my book, which will be out with Penn Press, and it's deeply indebted to Dan's scholarship and editorial guidance. Um, this book tells the stories of the region's smaller Native nations during the 18th century, and it argues that Native American immigration policies and diplomatic networks um, and practices made these indigenous Southerners powerful and helped them survive the onslaught of colonization. Um, it also argues that the, they critically influenced the European empires in the region. This project has Dan's fingerprints all over it, and I think it's a small testament to the many ways that Dan has shaped and cultivated the field. I think I'm one of the first grand fellows, I'm not sure if that's a word, of the McNeil Center. Dan mentored and worked with my advisor, Kathleen Duval, when she was a postdoc at the center, as well as with my dear friend, Christina Snyder, who's read my drafts for years. Seemingly then, this chain of academic influence fairly predestined that I would end up writing a book about Native power. So as I was revising my dissertation, Dan provided me with a critical piece of guidance that has shaped the project in a profound way. And no, it wasn't primary or secondary scholarship or any of the really important work that he has written. He suggested that I needed to figure out the political and social processes that brought small nations geographically together and sometimes severed their communities, leading to further waves of migrations. To emphasize his point, Dan said that I needed to explain the whoosh whoosh of native nations. <laughs> As you can probably see by this point, I seem to have an easier time communicating via wild gesticulations befitting one of those inflatable green men with flailing arms in a used car sales lot than with the English language. So his whoosh whoosh gesture stuck with me. Focusing on the whoosh whoosh, and this is now a formal technical term that I expect you all to use and cite Dan Richter properly as you move forward, enabled me to develop an argument about the importance of Native American migration and sanctuary policies. These policies helped protect and rehouse indigenous migrants and refugees, which often led to the development of multinational settlements. So when migrant nations settled alongside one another, 
So this would be the whooshing together of separate nations. These places created multiple allied autonomous nations who lived in close proximity, retained their autonomy, and took advantage of trade, military, and political opportunities that come with living alongside large numbers of people. This also helped me explain why small nations sometimes incorporated colonial settlements like Mobile and Natchez into indigenous multinational settlements, and also why they were sometimes kicked out. <laughs> that would be the, a part wishing part of this. These indigenous migration policies and diplomatic practices are key to understanding the development and fate of the Louisiana colony. To return to my earlier point about the community that Dan's fostered and my own decision to stay in academia and in early American history, I want to again emphasize Dan's humility and his regular insistence, again, this echoes Sari, um, although these are not precisely his words, that basically none of us get big headed and pompous. Mm -hmm. And he certainly leads by example. <coughs> it would be very easy to imagine how a center that recruits a whole cohort of people in the same field from different schools who are often applying to the same fellowships and jobs could feel like a snake pit. Instead, Dan's insistence on collaboration, workshopping, and enough politically fraught yingling and cheese boards to ease, to ease 15 junior nerds' social anxieties <laughs> provided many of us with the networks of friends, colleagues, and co-conspirators that have continued to shape our work long after we'd left. In my community, we talk a lot about how it's our responsibility to leave the door open and smooth the path behind us as we go. Meaning that our own success in any profession is not really the end goal, but rather it comes with the responsibility to make the road smoother and to provide opportunities for others who come behind us. I know that Dan has held many doors open for me and for many of us, and that he's paved a very broad path and made space for many more Native historians to come. So Dan, what I really want to say is Mishi Newe Mankwe, and that I hope that your LA retirement with Sharon and the singing rubber fish, Big Mouth Billy Bass, is going <laughs> swimmingly. <laughs> Thank you very much. And next, we shall hear from William Hunting Howell, who is Associate Professor of English at Boston University. He is the author of Against Self-Reliance, The Arts of Dependence in the Early United States, and the co-editor with Greta LaFleur of Yale University of the forthcoming American Literature in, Trans in Transition, Volume 1, 1770 to 1828. Dr. Howell. First, I also want to say a huge thank you to Kid and to Katie uh, and for the invite and to all of you uh, here and out there uh, in the world for being with us <clears throat> today to think about Dan Richter and his more or less immeasurable impact on the field of early American cultural studies. It's a real honor to be on this podium and in this company. Like half of the other people up here, I'm a literary scholar. Uh, I'm right now working on a book, uh, or not right now, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> maybe in my heart, working on a book called Worldly Muses, which is about occasional poetry between the revolution and reconstruction. That is, I think about the stubbornly time-bound, geographically specific issue-based poems that were written in diaries and letters, published in newspapers and magazines, printed onto trade cards, sewn into samplers, distributed as handbills, sung as ballads, etc. These things that suffused uh, the textual landscape of revolutionary and early Republican America. Rather than treat this material as marginal or extraneous to the project of building an American poetic tradition, this project restores it to its rightful place at the center. It shifts the burden of US culture making from the exalted few to the bustling many. And, you know, one might wonder what that has to do with Dan. Uh, well, most directly, this work posits a past in which modest people doing modest stuff nevertheless creates complex dynamics worth extended attention, respect, and analysis. And that seems to me like one of Dan's signature scholarly propositions, even if he probably wouldn't want anything to do with, uh, say, the kind of poetry you'd find in a 19th century newspaper, although that may actually not be true. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Indirectly, this project has everything to do with Dan because of the McNeil Center, which Dan, as you know, ran on Richterian, Richterian principles for many, many years. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and that's where I and how a whole lot of other people, not just people on this podium, but a great, great many, um, 
uh, people figured out how to do early Americanist work uh, in the first place. And that's in some way a function of the numberless seminars and brown bags and receptions and right groaning cheese boards um, and yingling, uh, oof, so much yingling. Um, you know, all that stuff that happens there, which is where I got to see just how vast the early American enterprise is and sometimes how I might plausibly situate myself within it. Just as importantly, much more importantly, uh, I got to watch Dan himself to see the do to, to see the work that he was doing to make those things happen like actively um, and to think about why he did the things that he did. So uh, in the spirit of um, repeating everything that you guys have already said, um, I'm going to tell you some of the things that I learned from Dan Richter. Most obviously, uh, like everyone in this room, I learned a ton about early North America, especially about ind indigeneity in early North America and about what a committed decolonial scholarship should look like. Other people to my right, for example, are way more qualified than I am to say just how important Dan's work has been for those fields. I'm just like a working class poetry guy. So beyond saying that it was utterly mind bending um, for me, I will defer. You already yeah. did it. It was um, a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. Okay. So uh, beyond that, I learned from Dan about how to do this job that we all do. He modeled for me and for everyone else that came into contact with him a sense of the power of radical curiosity. Dan wants to know about everything, I think. As far as I can tell, Dan wants to know about everything. He has so many questions. And he's, and he, I'm hoping I'm going to say this right. He's an expert, inexpert interlocutor. He, he has an uncanny and disarming way of putting his finger on the thing that you've been trying to explain and helping you to say what you mean. That is, he shows us how to be interested in things in ways that help those in possession of some little bit of knowledge frame it for general consumption. He helps us see the stakes of our inquiries before we even know what exactly we're inquiring about. And he makes everyone in the room feel seen and better and smarter than they were before. That's a big deal. I also learned a corollary of that radical curiosity that Dan's whole, whole scholarly persona, persona is built around. We bear a mutual responsibility for working on the problems that the past presents us. There are a million ways to be lonely doing what we do, grubbing our little patches of uh, you know, fainting <laughs> or faint light in the darkness. We fall down archival rabbit holes. Uh, we obsessively edit our own prose. And because we compete for exceedingly slender resources, we pitch our projects as of singular importance to presses and funding agencies. What Dan offers us, or offered me anyway, was a way to think about the enter... <laughs> <laughs> a way to think about the enterprise uh, of explaining and analyzing historical texts as always necessarily shared or as null without the sharing. We may work at some remove from one another, but we must always figure out a way to be in conversation. Dan encourages us to think in terms of points of contact, to recognize that there's always more to learn and that expertise in dialogue with expertise or inexpertise uh, is how new knowledge gets made. Hence Dan's, uh, as we've already discussed, exemplary and indefatigable commitment to building community. Put another way, I somehow wrote a monograph uh, and I'm intermittently writing this other one but probably the most meaningful scholarly experiences that I've had in my career have been collaborative editorial gigs, um, all of which it turns out have been with other MCAS alums who were similarly encouraged by Dan's example. I could go on like this, uh, but uh, I want to conclude my time with you today by talking in some detail about a moment from one of those seminars uh, that were so important to me that I think about all the time. Introducing a paper about which I remember nothing other than this, Dan, in perfect, perfect Dan deadpan, came out with an exquisite Danism. Why can't historians tell jokes timing? <laughs> I, it actually says, you can see here, pause for gales of laughter. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So this is an adaptation, of course, of a very old and deeply unfunny bit. I'm sure, I'm actually pretty sure, I heard Dan do it on other occasions, and I've definitely heard versions of it by other people that call it engineers, scientists, mathematicians, drummers, bass players, Norwegians. <laughs> that creative adapting in and of itself is a pretty damn thing to do. Not sure that Dan ever met a grim dad joke that he couldn't wait to make his own. <laughs> But, friends, I think there's more to think about, especially with respect to Dan's legacy in the field. First, turns out that groaning together at Dan's cannily terrible jokes can itself be a community building experience. <laughs> there may be precious little common ground between the senior scholar of the 19th century bond market and the graduate student working on 17th century medicinal gardens, but they can roll their eyes together at an <laughs> atrocious pun when they hear it. These shared micro traumas or, <laughs> or micro delights, however you want to see them, make a new in-group of everyone in the audience. I'm not saying that Dan is some kind of Brechtian theater genius, bringing catharsis and solidarity out of diffuse audiences with the power of impeccably delivered replacement level humor, but he may actually be. Second, in addition to the community building work of why can't historians tell jokes timing, it's also important to recall the power and significance of Dan's own evident pleasure at having executed the bit. The carefully calibrated pause, the slight arch of the eyebrow, the twinkle in the eye. Like this is a man who has perfected twinkling, like professional twinkling, which you don't see very much. A man who is deliberately making space for joy silliness in a high stakes professional setting in a job that all too uh, often equates seriousness with dourness or pomposity dan models a whole different way of being in the world we can be serious people working on serious subjects without being tendentious or paternalistic we can be authorities without being authoritarian lastly why can't historians tell jokes timing works as a joke because it's deliberately desperately sweaty it's funny because it offers us mastery and humility at the same time. It is also, and I cannot stress this enough, in the voice of a Dan Richter standing at the podium in front of an audience, a profoundly ethical gesture. And that's not merely because he's this preeminent figure making fun of his profession and himself, but because the joke makes a virtue of imperfection. Insofar as the past is a mess of contradiction and inexplicability, historiographical slickness is cause for suspicion, if not for alarm. The apparently totalizing argument is almost certainly wrong about a lot of stuff. Recognizing our intractable limitations as historians, not to mention the limitations of archives, institutions, uh, or prior historiography, is crucial to the project of doing responsible history. We cannot, in good faith, work on the problems of the past if we expect them to be one day irrefutably solved. Uh, to round this off, one of the great pieces of luck, or great timing, uh -huh, in my scholarly life, is that I got to work alongside, for, or alongside Dan for a couple of years. And though I've been away from, from the center for almost uh, you know, a decade and a half, I'm extremely glad to know that Dan is still everywhere, or you know, sort of everywhere advocating for the community that he's taken such pains to build, that he's here for all of us into perpetuity. Uh, to put it another way, even as he starts to dial back his commitments and his formal responsibilities, Dan remains like Walt Whitman's missing sheepdog at the end of the 1855 Song of Myself. Failing to fetch him at first, keep encouraged. Missing him one place, search another. He stops somewhere, waiting for yous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Christopher Parsons. He is Associate Professor of History at Northeastern University. He is the author of A Not-So-New World, Empire and Environment in French Colonial North America. His articles have appeared in many publications, such as the William and Mary Quarterly, Environmental History, Early American Studies, and in several edited collections. His current project traces the spread of smallpox and other European illnesses in New France, New England, and New Amsterdam, or New Netherland, in the 1630s, in order to understand how epidemic diseases shaped colonial encounters 
and Imperial Rivalries. Dr. Parsons. Thank you. Um, legitimately, thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to start with a, a real um, acknowledgement of gratitude to the MHS for organizing this, um, in part to get us out of the house and to see other people in person, but also really to acknowledge the role that Dan has had in our lives and our career, and to do it mostly in person. Um, one of the things that I've enjoyed about this is it's been a really wonderful opportunity to reflect as I put this together. And that's something that over the last 10 years, I left the McNeil Center in 2013, um, I haven't had a lot of opportunity to do. It's been a headlong rush into moving to Boston, working for tenure, having kids, starting a, fa starting a family, all the sort of stuff that has made the past decade a bit of a blur. But as I thought about um, Dan and the place um, in my life and career, what I actually thought about more was not my time at the center, but the time before that. Um, and I, I think it's actually more significant um, to discuss who Dan was to me before I arrived at the center than who Dan was to me when I was at the center. It's not particularly surprising that Dan was an excellent um, interlocutor and inspiration at the center. But when I first met Dan, um, which I kind of think of, I kind of met him for the first time three times over the course of uh, a year in 2008 and 2009, I was at that point just a random grad student uh, making forays into the US. I don't want to sound like I was an innocent coming out of the woods. I was a grad student um, at the University of Toronto, hardly um, the woods. But I was someone who up until that moment had really been trained as a Canadianist and still thought in those terms. And meeting Dan over the course of 2008 and 2009 really helped um, shape the transition into thinking about myself more as an early North Americanist or some version of that, um, as well as who I might want to be in the profession. The more I thought about those meetings we had over the course of 2008 and 2009, the more I realized how much it said about Dan and who he has been in our field, our fields and our lives. One of the things I noted when I was ever with Dan at the center, um, at brown bags, at conferences, at uh, salons, um, <coughs> he was regularly beset by people who wanted to talk to him, um, people who loved his work, people who wanted to get to know him, people who wanted to talk their way ideally into time at the McNeil Center. Um, and yet he always was so remarkably, I'm gonna use the word that I think everyone else has. Um, this is the hazard of having a P name, I guess. Um, generous and open. Um, no less true for being less original at this point, I guess. Um, so personally, he's become a really important interlocutor over the coming years. Um, or the years since then because of these traits. But professionally, I think he's made our fields more expansive. Um, also, I think really importantly, more creative. And, and I think this is something Hunt really emphasized too, more fun. The first time I, I met Dan um, was at the French Colonial Historical Society when it met in Quebec City in 2008. I arrived at this conference, uh, my supervisor and I drove out together from Toronto, and I had little sense of what to expect or even um, it became clear how to perform in that sort of setting. My primary orientation towards the meeting was that I was an Anglophone studying a Francophone topic um, and that I had to watch my whose toes I stepped, whose nationalist toes I might step on. It was only the year before that a shouting match in French and English had erupted at the Canadian Historical Association. And so I really thought into those terms of myself as a Canadian historian studying early Canadian history. I don't begrudge people being excited about seeing old friends at conferences um, and not making room, particularly room for new people. But as a presenter in his second year of graduate school with a bunch of medical acronyms that explain or at least predict anxiety that I feel in those sorts of settings, it was daunting. Um, and Dan was the chair of the panel I was on. Um, and I can still, and this tells you something about the character of his engagement, remember precisely how generous his reading of my chapter on tobacco was. And I can still remember specifically a part that he was, was particularly neat. Um, for obvious reasons, I chose to focus on that instead of the other one of the other big names who fell asleep in the front row um, during my talk um, with his dog. Actually, it was no small feat. They were both asleep. Um, and at lunch after and Dan took me to lunch after he continued showing real interest in what a random grad student from Canada was doing. 
and his work on New France. Um, and in his questions and advice, he pushed me towards thinking about what I was doing less in terms of national framing and more in terms of um, what our literary colleagues might ter term a hemispheric orientation. The next time I first met Dan was when I was in Philadelphia doing research at the American Philo Philosophical Society a few months later. Following up on meeting him at our conference, I wanted to get in touch when I was in Philadelphia to ask his advice about APS and its collections and really just to touch base again. I, and this is, I don't think unique to me, I'm perennially worried about seeming an imposition, but this was, seemed the opposite. Dan took me out for lunch when I was there, showed me the meal center for the first time. Little did I know the impact that that place would have on my life and continued to advise um, a random graduate student on Canada, from Canada on a research topic that while inspired by some of his work on the Haudenosaunee was far outside what he was working on himself. Nonetheless, um, he listened closely and offered insights that shaped the work right up until it became a book. And at this time, I had other interactions in American academia, and I can say that coming from a school in Canada, I didn't really understand how important it was if you were so and so supervisor, or you went to so and so school. I thought, at least initially, that Dan was the norm, and I learned repeatedly after that that he was not. Finally, the last first time I met Dan during this year, I had the good, the good fortune to actually stay at his house for a month um, when I was a fellow at the APS in April of 2009. I had been put in touch with him by a former student of his, Vanessa Manger, um, and it turned out to be a perfect place to work and live. He has a, or had a, an upstairs rental suite that I know a number of us have gone through. It was perfect to work from because it made the McNeil Center and other local archives easy to access, and perfect to live in because even though I was a random boarder, Dan and Sharon invited me to Easter dinner while I was there and made me feel at home in a way that I couldn't have imagined possible and was definitely different from my experiences of the sort of lonely research process that I had had in Paris and elsewhere. And I saw then, as a lot of us are saying now, that you can be a rock star academic and a really legitimately great human being. So in hindsight, I can think of Dan as a central figure in my professional and intellectual life. Um, I'm not the only one who will use the metaphor of fingerprints all over my book and major articles. And I actually can still hear some of the, the blunt critique in my head when I write to this day. Um, and I found over time that in the classroom, um, in my own research, and more recently, as I've taken on work for some indigenous communities working in the courts in Canada, that his work remains indispensable. At times, it's, he, it's an inspiration. At times, it's a useful interlocutor. And also, occasionally, it's something to wrestle with and critique myself. But throughout that, as I said, it remains indispensable. I'm in Boston at a job I love in large part because of the mentorship and acceptance that the McNeil Center made for a Canadian historian desperately trying to reframe themselves as an early Americanist. But none of that was, of course, a given when I met him as just another graduate student at a conference in Philadelphia. I can only imagine how my encounter was mirrored by others across Dan's career. As special as I like to sometimes think that I am, I deeply suspect that what made Dan such a feature of our community is his intellectual generosity, and I think even more so, to echo Hunt, his insatiable curiosity. Even though he didn't ever know precisely what I was working on, he asked smart questions and waited and seemed legitimately interested in my answers. And if he wasn't satisfied with them, pushed me to find better ones. <laughs> He really has always seemed to want to know more about what I, my cohorts, the McNeil Center, and every speaker who came through was working on, which is no small feat considering just the barrage of work that came at him. So while I can, of course, point to prize winning books that I continue to work with as I research and time, uh, research and teach, I think that what I want to celebrate tonight is the role that Dan has played in so many scholars' lives and from his position at Penn and the McNeil Center in our various fields that we can loosely put under the umbrella of early American studies, I want to celebrate the tenor and tone that he has set. Uh, rigorous, but generous, thematically and geographically expansive, serious, but fun. He's made every part of my life and our field better. I thank him again and the MHS for bringing us all together tonight. Thanks very much. And our final presenter is Joseph Rezik. He is Associate Professor of English and Director of the American 
and New England Studies Program at Boston University. He is the author of London and the Making of Provincial Literature, Aesthetics and the Transatlantic Book Trade, 1800 to 1850. And his work has appeared in, among others, American Literary History and Early American Studies and in several edited collections. His current book project, The Racialization of Print, will tell a new story about the changing relationship between technologies of print and ideologies of race in the long 18th century. Dr. Rezik. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the MHS, to Kid and Katie for this event, for all of you for being here. It's a true honor to be here to celebrate Dan, and obviously I'm a little nervous here closing out the show. So, um, but I think I do have some things to say that people haven't said before. And then of course, a lot of repetition here about Dan's generosity. Um, I'll mainly talk about interdisciplinarity. I'm a literary scholar and my, uh, at the McNeil Center, I was very, 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 very adjacent to Dan's area of expertise. But I think that's one thing that has, was really important to me. Okay, like almost everyone on earth, I met Dan Rector first as a graduate student. I had come to present a paper at the McNeil Center Graduate Conference in 2005 in the old building on Locust Walk. I was drafting my dissertation prospectus at the time. I gave a paper about Walter Scott's Waverly novels and how 19th century Americans treated them as real history, not novels at all, and how this was just the most fabulous thing about Scott, which I think is still true. The whole conference, I kept talking about this, that novels are just a good a record of history as history. And I do wonder that my relationship to the McNeil Center didn't just end permanently right then and there. <laughs> Dan, of course, was intrigued. And I think it was Dan who encouraged me to talk to another graduate student, Justine Morrison, then a McNeil Fellow and also a grad student at Penn's English Department. I'll never forget the way Justine described her dissertation in the most wonderful way over lunch. And I still have this idea that Penn grad students are just wonderful at describing their dissertations over lunch. <laughs> I'll also never forget the thing that most surprised me about the conference, which was the seriousness with which graduate students were treated as scholars. I think this is what sets the McNeil Center apart from almost every other scholarly institution I've been a part of. Graduate students are the center of the center. As everyone knows, this respect for graduate students is one of Dan's most remarkable weaknesses. Two years later, in 2007, I was a dissertation fellow across the river at the Library Company of Philadelphia and became one of the many interlopers at the McNeil Center Friday seminars. Each week, I sat on the 21 bus as it traveled far more slowly down Walnut Street than if I had decided to walk, and I pondered the many mysteries of the Friday seminars, not least of which was that Dan called everybody by name during the Q&A, rendering the carpeted, well-lit seminar room a kind of cheers for early American studies. Of course, he was simply sort of like putting together putting people together in order according to the sign-up sheet. It took me a while to figure out how he actually knew everyone's name. Um, but what strikes me even to this day, though, having attended hundreds of seminars where people remain mostly nameless, is again how rare that kind of generosity is. So it was around this time, 2007, 2008, that Dan started working with Jim Green at the Library Company of Philadelphia and Peter Stallybrass, professor of English at Penn and organizer of the weekly History of Material Text Workshop, to develop a program on early American literature and material texts. This program I'm gonna speak about a little bit for a while, I'm glad no one has mentioned it. Um, it received funding eventually from the Mellon Foundation and it provided two dissertation fellowships annually for literary scholars. This program drew on Penn's strengths in literary book history and it overlapped seamlessly with my own area of expertise. Although I was by then uh, ineligible for a dissertation fellowship, Either by coincidence or design, I was selected during this program's inaugural year, 2009, for McNeil's two-year postdoc. I am actually dizzy at the thought of how rich those two years were. For anyone working on early American studies and book history, it was simply the best place on earth to be. Fridays, there were the McNeil seminars. Mondays, just across 34th Street, there was the material text workshop on the sixth floor of Van Pelt Library. Down Spruce Street, Spruce Street there was Penn Press, home of the McNeil Center book series and also the book series devoted to material texts. All of these things are still true today, but Dan's leadership in that period and his eagerness to collaborate with colleagues in literature provided a strong and lasting institutional bridge. It was right in the middle of my time there in 2010 that the McNeil Center co-sponsored a conference that grew into one of the most influential books in the material text series, Early African American Print Culture, edited by Laura Langer Cohen and Jordan Alexander Stein. Between 2009 and 2016, the years of the Mellon Grant, there were week-long seminars, seminars in the summer taught by many luminaries in the field of American book history. 
a scholarly monument to this program exists in all of the work of the people who went through this, um, and also in the form of a special issue of Early American Studies, the McNeil Center Journal, um, edited on this topic. I mean to highlight all this to emphasize Dan's role as a collaborator and institution builder across disciplines. The McNeil Center had always welcomed the odd literary scholar each year, but with Dan's support for material text scholarship, really felt like he had found a way to bring some of the most exciting scholars working in early American literary studies together. Perhaps the most important thing I learned from Dan and from the McNeil Center is what kind of literary scholarship is legible to historians. This question was particularly urgent during my McNeil era. Um, Eric Slaughter had visited the McNeil Center in 2007 to deliver a version of his trade gap lecture that would become his influential 2008 essay about the historiographical relationship between the fields of early American literature and history, pointing out that while literary scholars often cite historians, the reverse was not always the case. I reached Eric by email yesterday, um, and he was able to look up Dan's initial invite for this lecture. He told me that Dan had heard him give a version of the talk in Williamsburg earlier that year and had invited him to come to Philadelphia. Remembering how I sat there riveted at Eric's talk, I'm struck with just how attentive Dan was to the things that mattered to literary scholars. Dan taught me that historians appreciate literary scholarship that does not pretend to be history. What I mean by this is that he effused a certain skepticism about what kinds of claims can be drawn from textual evidence. This was less something he said directly than a little nudge here or there, a subtle nod from the front table after a certain kind of question from the audience in the seminar room, a hesitance about wild claims about early American culture or ideology based on a single novel or poem. What made this evidentiary skepticism so powerful to me was Dan's equally strong embrace of and respect for close reading as a non-trivial scholarly activity. Unlike some historians, Dan never dismissed traditional literary questions as inherently superficial or unimportant. That has been said to me at panels by historians. He just seemed to caution against literary scholars trying to answer the wrong questions. And again, this was never via direct critique. It was more something I learned from what kind of work he supported rather than anything he condemned. I think it's fair to say that Dan was always the most generous reader in that seminar room, far more generous than us graduate students and more generous than many senior scholars in attendance. Very often, Dan simply stayed quiet like a Ben Franklin at the Continental Congress. This is a tribute not to Dan's modesty, I don't think, but rather to his always respectful pedagogical genius. In my final year in Philadelphia, 2011, Dan published Before the Revolution. I still use the copy he signed after an author event at the now closed Penn Bookstore. I've been rereading it recently because my teaching and scholarship have skewed earlier and earlier. Once a 19th centuryist, now I go all the way back to the 17th century. And as is my prerogative as a literary scholar, I want to close with some attention to Dan Richter as a writer, and in particular, how he begins a story. Before the revolution opens with something familiar to bring in the general reader, quote, we have it in our power to begin the world again, over again, Thomas Paine wrote in 1776. But Richter asks, what came before? Quote, the American revolution, he argues, submerged earlier strata of society, culture and politics, but those ancient worlds remain beneath the surface to mold the nation's current contours. The book's place in historiography mimics this structure. Beneath the, loose, the surface of Dan's lucid, clear, teacherly prose is the work of hundreds of scholars who have laid the substrata upon which stands his own narrative, which is molded on theirs even as it makes something new. What a thrilling choice to begin a book with a famous line about beginnings and to launch an extended geological metaphor that works both for history and the act of history writing itself. Each new layer, Richter writes, spread over the older ones, but what came before never fully disappeared. Historians here are geologists who spend their time excavating footnotes and endnotes, troves of primary sources and archives, building layer upon layer before mounting their own revolutionary structures on the surface. Dan, Richter, Dan Richter's work as a historian and his work as a mentor and friend provided the grounding for hundreds of scholars who revolutionized and are still revolutionizing the field of early American studies. What a strong foundation for us. Thank you, Dan.
thank you everyone. And now Dan Richter. <coughs> well, you people did it. You ignored instructions. <laughs> you got maudlin. I instructed each of you to have at least two puns in your talk, and there were almost none of those. <laughs> and you made me just not know what to say, but except just, I guess, a couple of things. Whenever I got tired at the McNeil Center, I used to remind myself that I had the best job in the world, which was to give bright young people money and hang out with them for a year. And uh, all of your talk about carefully constructing community and all that, I was just having fun hanging out with bright young people for a year. And that's uh, the thing I'll miss most. And I hope the thing that Emma Hart sitting here is going to uh, enjoy for herself over the next uh, couple of decades as well. But um, other than that, again, it's just, it's so wonderful to see all of you and to see what, uh, what you've become um, and uh, to recognize Hunt behind all that hair and facial hair that we didn't <laughs> used to have, um, to recognize all of you behind your masks and, and all the rest. Um, but it was also fun to watch the live captioning while this thing was going on. <laughs> So uh, I, I learned that you can write an honor species. <laughs> There's such a thing as a blood surge to savages that I've been caving the way for people all, all, all along. And particularly, I kept hearing, watching these references to dance scholarship, which is exactly, <laughs> which is not what uh, what I do. I don't think. Um, and uh, a priori stratigraphy. That was another great one. Um, but it was uh, again it's just i'm i'm humbled to be here i don't really know what to say except thanks to all of you thanks to the mhs for for um hosting this thanks for so many people over the years who have been wonderful uh people at, at the mcneil center and i also want to thank my own mentor um frank bremer who got me started um, at thomas more college because if if he taught me anything it was that um you can be a scholar and a human being at the same time and i've tried to I uh, tried to keep that, uh, that in mind all the way along. Uh, also, my years at Dickinson College teaching undergraduates um, in some ways helped pave the way for the, my, my most favorite teaching experience at, at Penn was actually that honors seminar that Alicia told you about. And um, uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful. But also, I always keep in mind the motto of Benjamin Rush. Somebody said we heard too much about Benjamin Rush, but I'm gonna bring him back. <laughs> Uh, I'm also going to talk about the Keithian schism before we're done. <laughs> but Benjamin Rush had a motto for Dickinson College that its its purpose was to civilize the half barbarian inhabitants of Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I've always thought that maybe if I'd done anything, it was slightly to civilize the half barbarian inhabitants of Academe. And um, uh, of course, I'm one of those barbarians as well. We're all at the gate, and I think it's time for me to shut up and just say thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to all of you for your great work and your great scholarships. And thanks for hanging out with me for all those years. It was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're just at time. So I think this is going to bring our program to a conclusion. And um, thank you, uh, Dr. Richter, for joining us and for all of these uh, wonderful uh, scholars uh, for looking back on their experiences at the wonderful McNeil Center. So uh, on behalf of the Massachusetts Historical Society and the members of the steering committee for the Pauline Mayer Early American History Seminar, I wish everyone a wonderful evening and join us next season for more programs in this and many other series here at the MHS. Thank you, everyone, and good night.